Welcome back to this series on the Brielle Altair 8800 replica kit. In part three of this video we're going to talk about what other components you need to operate the unit, do an initial power up and see uh, if the assembled kit works properly and then we'll look at some of the basic operation including running some programs in Altair Basic and entering a small machine language program from the front panel and running it. Before we do that, I wanted to answer a question that was still unresolved when I was working on part two of the video, assembling the unit. The resistor R15 was included with the kit and there was a place to assemble it, but according to the manual, it said that R15 should be missing. So I did a little investigation on that and talked to some of the people on the forums about it. And the answer is that R15 should be installed, so you should insert it in the location you can see here at the top of this group of resistors. If it's not present, you're going to see some problems with the uh, horizontal stability of the video if you're using a composite monitor. So you can safely ignore the indication in the manual that it shouldn't be installed. Other than that, I had no issues during assembly. Uh, here's a look again at the inside. I've now installed the external serial adapter that's new in this fourth batch of boards. Now in order to use the unit we're going to need a few extra pieces of hardware. To start with at minimum we need a power supply. We need something that puts out between 7 and 9 volts at up to 1000 milliamps. So this could be the, uh, a small wall wart type AC adapter. Uh, just make sure that it's something that can put out a current of 1 amp and uh, preferably is regulated. For my testing I'm going to use a bench power supply so I know I've got a good clean source of power and I can adjust the voltage. Now that actually is enough if you want to operate the unit entirely using the front panel switches and LEDs, but I think uh, you're likely you're going to want to make use of some of the more advanced features or more convenient features uh, that it offers. So you're going to want to have an SD card for storage. Uh, so this can be any of these commonly available SD cards um, and just about anything one or two gigabytes and up is probably going to be more than enough room for this software. Uh, I've got used an old 2 gigabyte card that I had around. Uh, I'm not going to go through the process of initializing the card. It's documented pretty well in the Brielle manual, but you need to make sure that you've got a FAT file system on there and you'll want to copy a few of the binary files for things like um, Altair Basic onto the SD card. You're also going to want to have a keyboard and for that uh, you want to dig up one of the older PS2 type PC keyboards. I had an older one here. So this would be the type with the old PS2 connector, not USB. Um, probably you've got one of these lying around somewhere or you can maybe pick one up at a thrift store or a dollar store. You're also going to want a something for video output and for that you can use either a composite TV type monitor or you can use a VGA monitor. I'm actually going to try using both. So I have here uh, an older Commodore monitor from the Commodore 64 VIC-20 era that's got a composite input and I'm also going to use a, a little more modern uh, flat screen LCD monitor that has a VGA output. So to hook things up on the back the power connector uh, goes here SD card goes in this slot, PS2 keyboard here, composite video if you're using goes here with an RCA jack and or VGA connector right here. I've also got the optional serial port connected here for um, the external serial port which we'll look at sometime later in the series. So let's hook up the hardware and see if this thing actually works. I've now hooked up the power supply inserted the SD card, hooked up the keyboard and the two monitors. So let's turn it on and see what happens. Initially I've got all of the switches turned off or in the lower position and I'm going to hit the power switch and we'll see what happens. So we've got some activity on the LEDs. Uh, some of them are flashing so that looks promising. And let's take a look at what's happening on the monitors. On the composite monitor we're seeing a message that we've got the Altair 8800 micro 
and the terminal software version 5.1 and CPU version 5.1 have come up. So that looks promising and we've got a flashing cursor at the bottom. And we see a similar message on the VGA monitor. The firmware comes up, same version, flashing cursor. In this case we've got a little wider 80 column text display and the text is a little sharper on this LCD monitor than it is on the television type composite monitor. So things are looking good. Let's see if we can load some software. Now it's possible to load and run programs using just the front panel and we'll look at that a little later. But to get started, let's try loading some software off of the SD card. In this case, the original Altair Basic. So to do that, um, we can turn the unit off. We put on the turn up the aux switch and address switch 11 and then power the system up or we could have reset it in that state. Over on the video output now, as the system boots up, we see a new prompt saying binary file load and asking us for a file name. Now I've earlier put on a number of files here including basic, so we'll load the 8K version of Altair Basic, which is in the file 8kbas.bin. So um, we're we're still talking now to the firmware on the Altair. It's asking us for the start address of the program, which is the default of zero. And it now starts reading the file. Back on the front panel, we can see lots of activity of addresses being loaded. And back on the monitor now, we get a prompt memory size, which is coming from Altair Basic and is one of the first questions that it asks when it boots up. It asks you for how much memory to use. The default if you hit enter is to use all the available memory that it can find. And then asks for the terminal width. In this case we can take the default of 80. And finally it asks whether you want the optional trig functions which take a little more memory. Uh, so let's say yes. And we're now in the old Altair Basic from 1976. Uh, which look, should look pretty familiar to anybody who's used BASIC on a computer of this vintage. So let's type a little uh, program in BASIC and see if it runs. Directly type in a three-line program here to print out some numbers. In this case, uh, the numbers from 1 to 10. So we can type those in, we can list our program, and type run and see the output. So much like uh, just about any basic of this vintage, uh, the 8K version is actually a pretty complete version of basic. The full manual, which was written by Microsoft, uh, is included on the uh, Briel CD, so you can take a look at that manual, look at all of the basic commands and syntax. There's also a 4K version that's a little smaller and frees up memory. And incidentally, the Altair computer by default like this has 32K of memory available uh, of which we've got, let's see, after loading 8K basic we've got about 26K available to our basic programs. We're now looking at the VGA output which uh, essentially mirrors the same as the composite video output although it's a little wider. Uh, I should mention there's some keyboard function keys that you can type uh, from the keyboard when using the monitor to do various things such as changing the color of the display. So for example, Control F3 allows us to change the text color on the VGA display. And Control Alt F3 will change the background color. So you can tailor that the way you'd like. Similarly, you can change uh, colors on the composite as well. Uh, there's a number of different options here, uh, things like um, whether you want to um, have caps lock and num lock enabled on startup, uh, controlling the serial port, and things like that. Uh, there's also uh, follows the standard VT100 terminal emulation, so you can run programs that are written for a VT100 type terminal, and you can run terminal escape sequences to do things like change color and move the cursor around. So let me demonstrate an example of a basic program. I'll reset the system and we'll load a different program this time.
So now rebooting with the file name prompt, uh, there's some nice features here. We can hit Control Alt D, for example, and we can actually get a directory listing of the files that are on the SD card. Uh, in my case, we've got a um, binary file that was saved for a basic program to play uh, the AC Ducey card game, and it's in a file ac.bin. So let's load that. So that's actually a full memory dump of the entire 32K uh, that was taken when the system was running this game. And there's facilities from the keyboard to load and save memory from the keyboard, as well as a loading and saving text files. So you can take the source code for an existing basic game and load it into basic without having to type it in manually, uh, and also save it to the SD card as text if you'd like. The CD comes with a whole bunch of games from this era uh, written in BASIC that you can run. In some cases you may need to do a little bit of porting. You can also take and port a lot of existing games that you might find in older books of BASIC games. So we've now loaded that. We're in BASIC and we can run this card game. Uh, so let's see how we do. Uh, this is a card game. The uh, goal is to give them two cards to bet on whether the next card drawn will be in between the two cards that you've got, in which case you win. If it's not in between the cards, you lose. So we can bet uh, on each hand here. So the first we've got a ten and a queen. Not a very good bet, so I think I'm going to bet nothing on that one. So now we've got six and queen, so let's make a small five dollar bet. And we lost that one, so we're now down to $95. Next bet, a 2 and an ace, so that's a really good bet. It's pretty safe. Why don't we try uh, betting the whole $95? And I've won, so now up to $190. And the next is a 4 and a 10. Let's bet $10 on that. No, and I'm 1 up to 200 5 and a queen, that's not too bad. How about I bet the total 200 again? And unfortunately I lost, so I've lost the game. It gives me the option of whether I want to play again or not. So if I say no, you can see we're in basic and look at the listing of the program. So as I said, you can run or port uh, old games of this vintage written in basic and it's pretty compatible with most of the basics of the time being written by Microsoft. Now let's look at using the front panel to enter a small program and run it. Um, I doubt that you'll be spending uh, many hours programming in the front panel, but it can be fun and instructive to try it out and understand how early computers were programmed using the front panel. Um, computers like the Altair and mainframes and things of the time, some of these had to be programmed initially from the front panel. In some cases, the operator would have to enter a bootloader program manually to bring the rest of the operating system up. So both the Brielle manual and the full Altair manuals that come on the CD cover in detail how the front panel is used and give a number of examples. I'm going to step through a small program that was the first program listed in the Altair manual uh, as an example of showing how to use the front panel. I'm going to go through the sample program reasonably quickly and we'll cover all of the details, but the Altair manual is quite good starting with basics including things like binary and octal numbering systems in giving a number of example programs. In our case we're going to uh, write a simple program that reads two memory locations, adds the contents of them, and stores it in a third memory location. That's actually going to take about um, 14 bytes of memory, 14 memory locations, to cover the machine language instructions to do that. So we'll enter this on the front panel and run it and see if we get the correct result. Again, I won't cover all of the details of the front panel, but I'll give you a little flavor for how it's done. So we'll turn the unit on. And now it's currently operating, so we'll um, if I just point a few details. The 16 LEDs here are the address lines that are used for monitoring the address lines of the CPU and for specifying addresses when you're entering programs from the front panel. The 8D 
LEDs are the data lines, and those are used for um, displaying and in entering data uh, for memory locations. We've also got a number of other switches that are used for various functions, and we'll use some of those in the demo here. So to start with, let's move from run operation to stop. So we actually stop the CPU, and we can enter our program without the CPU running. So we're going to enter this program starting at address 0. Some of the basic operations, if we specify an address here using the address lines, um, we can read or write to that location. Um, 0 is down and 1 is up for these switches, so right now I've got them all down, which corresponds to address 0. You'll notice that the switches and LEDs are grouped in threes. That was to facilitate programming in octal rather than binary. Um, Octal or Base 8 was pretty commonly used on the early Altair computers, although today people tend to use um, hexadecimal. So if you're working with the front panel, you'll want to um, write your programs down as Octal to make them easier to enter, and that's what I'll be doing. So right now we've got the address switches for address 0. If we hit examine, we can see the contents of address 0. Um, the address lines now all go to all zeros, and the data LEDs are all off, indicating zero, so we've currently got uh, zero stored in address zero. So our program, we want to, uh, we'll start with address zero. The first data that we want to enter in octal is 072. So we do that with the, the same switches here. So this is zero, seven is three switches up, and 2 is a 0, 1, 0. So we can now hit deposit and write that data into the previous memory location 0. And we see these LEDs correspond to 0, 7, 2, matching the switches that we've got. Now we're going to proceed going through all the addresses. Um, to reduce the number of switches you have to play with, there's a facility here, deposit next, that will write data to the next uh, subsequent memory address. So we now want to write to address 1. So we can set the switches for the data for address 1, which is 200 octal 200. Zero, zero. And by hitting deposit next, we'll write that to address 1. So there's our 200, zero, zero, and we're seeing address 1. So I'm going to continue with subsequent addresses. The next data is 000. zero, zero. And I'll hit deposit next. 107 Two zero 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 six two two zero two zero 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 three zero three zero 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 and the final uh, data for our program is 000. zero, zero. And that should correspond to address 00015, zero, 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 which it does, so it looks like we're good. The final thing is to enter the data for this program, the two numbers that we're going to add, and, and I'm going to initialize the memory location where the result is stored. So the numbers, this program is going to read the two numbers from address 200 and 201 and write it to 202. So we're not, we're going to jump to a different address now, so let's specify address 200 and examine. We can see the current contents of that, which happens to be zero. I want to put a one in there. So we'll set the switches to one. 
and deposit. And in the address 201, the next address will be the second number that we want to add. Um, I'd like to use 2 for that number. So let's set this to 2, deposit next. And the next memory location 202 will hold the result. Let's put a 0 in there so that we know if we get the correct result um, that it, the, the correct result wasn't already at that memory location. So the next memory location 202 we put zeros in there. So now we have a program loaded. Let's just check that we correctly entered all the data. So going back to address 0, examine, we can check that the data is correct. So let me quickly look and see if this matches what it should be. The starting with address 0 should be 072. I'll hit examine next. 200, 000, 000, 107, 072, 201, 000, 200, 062, 202, 000, 303, 000, and 000. And let's check again the data instruction starting at address 200. We hit examine. So the two numbers we want to add, 1, and then the next address, 2. And the third address, we want to write the result, which should be 3, but we currently put a 0 in there. So let's go to the start address of our program, 0, and examine it. And we're ready to go. So we could now hit run, and our program will run. Now the way the program was written, it actually does the add, and it goes back and continues doing it. So if we give it um, more than a few you know, microseconds to run, it should be complete. So let's now go to stop and see whether we got the result that we wanted. So we'll go to our address 200. Here's the 1 and the 2. And the next address should contain the sum of 1 and 2, which would be 3. And indeed, we now see 3, whereas before we had 0 there. So our program looks good. If we wanted to debug the program, we can single step the program, and that's quite useful. In fact, this is something you may want to do with the front panel, even if you're programming um, using the keyboard and screen. Occasionally, you may want to stop and step through your program with the front panel. So what we can do is show doing that. We'll go back to address 0 and examine it. And now we can use the step key when we're in the stopped mode and step through our program. Uh, so if we hit step once, we can see that we're now, we've now gone to address, um, we've executed the, inst the instruction at address 0 and we've moved to address 1. And as we step through, we can see stepping through the different addresses. Now we're at address 2. And now we actually see the next cycle here as the processor is reading address 200 to read the uh, the data to be added from 200. So we're seeing the cycle where it's reading address 200 and it's reading the one that was stored there. If we continue, we're now at address 3, reading the instruction there. Address 4, address 5, 6, and now the process is reading address 201 to read the data stored there which is the number 2. So we can continue 7, um, 10 octal, 11, 12, and now we are seeing the right to address 202 of the result, which is 3. So we can see that our uh, calculation was done correctly. The final instruction at um, the next instruction here is a jump to address 0. 
So that's a jump instruction and it's reading the next two bytes of the jump address. And now we've jumped back to location zero and looped around. An even more convenient debugging method uh, that's supported in the Altair firmware or the, the Brielle firmware is some debug information that goes out to the display at the same time using the front panel. If we lift the aux switch, then as we step through our program, we can see some debug output as our program is executed. So we can see the values of the registers, program counter, and even a disassembly of the instruction. So this format with the aux key up, every time we step, we're stepping one machine cycle, not necessarily a full instruction. So as we hit a new instruction, we see the uh, disassembly there. If we lift both aux and protect keys, then we step one instruction at a time, and each time I hit the button, we see another instruction executed. So this is very useful, even e easier to debug than using the front panel LEDs, but it's using the same technique. So I hope that gave you a flavor for some of the basic features and operation of the Brielle Alter 8800 front panel and basic. I'm going to go off and spend some more time uh, getting more familiar with basic, look at some old basic programs, maybe see if I can find a port of the classic Star Trek game in basic, which is always one of my favorites. I've also been got to do a firmware upgrade. This came with the 5.1 firmware for the terminal and the CPU emulator, but there's actually a newer 5.2 version with a few more features, so I think I'll try doing the upgrade. I also plan in future videos to cover the RAM disk board and running the CPM operating system, uh, which requires the RAM disk. So I hope you join me for those videos as well.